prayer and the Lord's Prayer this morning. Acorns fall to earth, a dust to dust returns. We know this is how you planned it, God, but still we push against these truths. We resist the depths of grief and the embrace of the earth. We busy ourselves with other things in order not to remember, not to feel. Let us fall softly then into faith. Let us land safely grounded, trusting that every step of our transformation will be guided by your unending grace and love. With Jesus we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'm really wondering what this case is. 
see your hard work fall apart. Once we finish a Bible story, there's all kinds of stuff happening in our minds. All kinds of new seeds that get planted and new things that come grow. Let's have a prayer today. Close your eyes or open your eyes. You can close your hands or open your hands or whatever feels good. God, thank you for endings and beginnings. Thank you for trees turning and leaves falling. Thank you for making us mindful that new leaves will come again in another season. Thank you for blessing us with creativity so that we can imagine and create wonderful things to share. And so that we can help take care of this beautiful earth and all of the trees in it. God, help us remember the way you Repair and renew and inspire every day of our lives. Amen. Thank you for sharing your story with me. If you'd like to play with some chocolate stuff, you can make your own stories at the time too. So if you'd like, you can take this book back and you can look at it. And you can also go outside when you like to play with chocolate. And when you're done with it, you can put it on the blue bench at the back. Imagine if every fallen leaf has its own prayer. Imagine if every creature in the world has its own way of participating in worship. I invite you to hold space for that thought as we join our human prayers together this morning. May the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord. There are joys and sorrows that come with the season and some that do not respect our calendars. This morning, I lift up continued prayers for a young man, Adam, who is wrestling with serious illness. I lift up prayers for those who are dealing with cancer and other serious illnesses. I lift up prayers for those like Anne and Mike and others we know who are occupying that mystical threshold of life into life, who are drawing closer to God's ultimate embrace. Are there other prayers of joy or concern that you'd like to live this morning? The 
love the creator of all things. We ask you this day to knit us back together. There is so much that has unraveled in the garden of humanity. There are so many of us at loose ends. And so many of us dedicated to protecting our sisters and brothers who feel overwhelmed by the burden of that care. Even as we find ourselves tattered and torn, O oh God, you have given us the strands to create the design we are meant to be a part of. You have given us so many beautiful colors, so many different fibers of varying strength and resilience, all of which have their place in this beautiful design that we share. We thank you for the signs of promise around us, for fruit ripening on the trees, for leaves turning their beautiful jewel colors, for an atmosphere and landscape of plenty. And we acknowledge that in our human landscape, O oh Lord, there is so much that feels scarce. For some of us, there is scarce hope with frightening diagnoses. For some of us, there is scarce trust in places of violence. For some of us, there is a struggle to trust the structures of society as we strive to do our best to be in the work of repair, of building resilience, of reclaiming our legacies, of offering a new generation our best promises. So God, be with us. Surround us in our times of unraveling. Remind us that your helpers are everywhere around us. Your invisible helpers, your visible helpers, the tireless workers in the very earth itself, the people behind the scenes who are ensuring that we will have the resources for the care that is needed in these times. For those who labor in factories to make protective gear and testing materials. For those who make and distribute vaccines. For those who check that children's masks are worn properly every day at school. For those who check temperatures and keep an eye on all the subtle signs to make sure that each population is monitored for health and tended as needed. Oh well, God, we thank you. May we never lose sight of all of these different kinds of health. May we find ourselves uplifted as this garment of hair is rewoven around us. And may we each be part of its continual reweaving, that it may be a cloak of protection, that it may be a web of support, that it may be a tapestry in which every thread is celebrated in treasure. These things we lift up in prayer to you, our maker, our redeemer, and our sustainer, this day and every day.
scripture reading this morning comes from the letter of James. Now the tradition tells us that James was the brother of Jesus. The tradition has also taught us that it was common practice for the writers of these early letters of our faith to take on the name of someone well known in the community so that the weight of their message would be honored by each community in reach. And so it is possible that the brother of Jesus crafted these words that were handed down, and it is also likely that someone claiming the legacy of James, his wisdom and his witness, was the one who shared these words in his name with the hope that that wisdom would be carried on and spread out through many communities of faith. Now this letter, like most New Testament letters, is speaking to the divisions that need not be present when a community is guided by the teachings of Jesus Christ. And it is also colored by the culture and the times in which the words were crafted. So you'll hear a bit of that old Greek dualism that has to always pit one thing against another, in this case, heavenliness and earthliness. Hear this passage from the third chapter of the letter of James, reading from 3.13 through to 4, verse 3 and then verses 7 and 8. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness, born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such Wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and do not have it. So you commit murder, and you covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have, because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive, because you ask wrongly, in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and the devil will flee from you. Draw near to God, and God will draw near to you. God, in this space that holds both heaven and earth, open ourselves to this wisdom, to your wisdom, that our words may be guided by your word. This is the first of four Sundays in our annual reflection of the seasons of creation. Recognizing that at this time in human history, it is the work of faith to understand how our ethics 
are informed by the crisis of our planet. And so for the next four Sundays, we will hear Ethics at the Edges, a challenge to connect the daily practice of our faith with the realities that the earth makes sure we attend to in this challenging time. So this Sunday, Earth will move into fire and water and air in the Sundays to come. They called it an improvement path. We'll go in, take out all the broken and diseased trees, and leave the good timber to size up. It sounded good to us. God knows about this sort of thing a little bit, with the cutting and preparing of trees. Well, an improvement cut sounded good to us. It matched all the advice that we read in the newsletters from Swarm, the Small Woodlot Owners Association of Maine. And we really wanted to do this thing right. We called up the district forester to confirm our plan, harvest all the trees in our forest that have been damaged by ice storms, get a little bit of money from selling the low-grade wood and a couple of years firewood in the garden. Then the big trees in our woods would have more room to stretch and grow, better airflow around their branches to fight disease. The district forester confirmed it. This was the best known practice. According to the government list, indeed, of best forestry practices, an improvement cut was a smart thing to do. Getting rid of the old and broken stuff made as much sense as clearing up some rooms and having a yard sale. So we picked a logging company from the certified list, drew up a plan, and had it done. They were careful. I'll give them that. I grew up in a region of brutal clear cuts where the timber companies and the pulp mills stripped forests, replanted them as single species plantations, and then stripped them again, rapidly denuding and degrading the land. The loggers we chose laid down massive mats over string beds so their equipment wouldn't destroy them. They planned the yarding area and the logging road so that a series of bumper trees would protect the rest of the forest as those trees were dragged out. I have tremendous respect for the care they took in their operation. And we did end, we did end up with a good couple years of firewood. But over the next few years, Here's what else we found. Without those storm-damaged but still living trees to hold the soil stable around them, a number of the strong, healthy trees fell down. They fell down fast and hard, ripping up great swaths of earth with them from the thin soil. And then we walked those nice, newly opened logging, logging roads in the days after a good rain to enjoy the forest would so thoughtfully improve. There were no mushrooms anywhere for years. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. The letter of James was written to address human conflict. And as I mentioned, James, or the author who claims his authority, fell prey to the Greek dualistic thinking that was so popular in his day, and it's unfortunate that he described virtues as coming from heaven, and vices as being earthly. Because it turns out that the wisdom of the earth is not unspiritual or devilish at all. 
this week alongside my biblical commentaries, I was studying the work of research scientists. Suzanne Samard, Merlin Sheldrake, Katie Field. Katie Field, great name for a researcher in the woods. Now, Suzanne Samard spends most of her time working with temperate rainforests on Canada's western edge. One of her greatest discoveries involved the sad, spindly little Charlie Brown trees that start their life in the deep shade under the arching canopy of the temperate rainforests. She had noticed that there were certain old trunks from previous cuts, as well as these tiny baby trees that should have been rotting away and dying off. And yet, mysteriously, intriguing to her scientific mind, the trunks were as full of vigor as any uncut wood and the tiny Charlie Brown trees were thriving even though they were com almost completely blocked from photosynthesis. In her research, she discovered that through the network underneath the soil, with the help of mycorrhizal fungi, all of the great giant trees were transferring nutrients to those old trunks and struggling children in their midst. Suzanne Savard was recently interviewed on the On Being program, which wrestles with the big questions of our existence. And she admitted over the course of the interview that even though she knew it was frowned upon in the scientific community, she cannot help but to see that the forest is like a human family. She says when you look at the work of those old trees and everything they share, and the way they create environments where new life can flourish beneath them, she said, I cannot help but think of mother. Now, Merlin Sheldrake, is the son of Rupert Sheldrake, a British plant biochemist who became shunned by the scientific community for his suggestion that plants seemed to have memories. Like Suzanne Simard, Merlin Sheldrake became interested in how nutrients are transferred in forest ecosystems. His research led him to focus on the relationship between plants and fungi. The more he researched, the more he discovered that fungi are responsible for almost all nutrient transfer, that plants without them can do very little. In fact, the term mycorrhizae literally means fungal root. And these symbiotic relationships, according to amazing fossil remnants they found of prehistoric plants, the activity of the fungi to transfer nutrients seems to even predate the root formation of plants themselves in the earliest beginnings of what you could call a plant. And so he says it's true. Mycorrhizae, the fungi, came first. They are the ones, perhaps, who created the entire structure of everything that plants do worldwide underground. They are the ones who created and continue to inform that process. And the thousands, perhaps millions, of different mycorrhizal fungi are the ones primarily responsible for the health of our entire ecosystems. Without them, life could not have even emerged from the ocean onto land. They were always there from the beginning, informing, perhaps teaching, always sharing. 
that AB field delved even further into these mycorrhizal relationships, these relationships between fungi and plants. She decided that our term evolution is actually not necessarily the best word. She suggests that perhaps we should think instead of involution, because it is the different plants and fungi starting to get into each other's lives that allow life to change and diversify. When she looks at the specific relationships, she notes that every single different type of fungi has its own distinct metabolic process of chemical exchange. One type might help the trees to get the phosphorus they require to flourish. Another might focus entirely on ensuring that sugars get where they need to be. Every single one of these beings has its own metabolic signature. Katie Field refers to this as their song. These patterns of repeated chemical exchanges form the signature song of each type, like a musical motif. You know in Peter and the Wolf, how the flute tune always signals that it's time for the little bird to appear in the story? And when you hear the bassoon, it means that Peter's grandfather will soon appear. Imagine how many different songs are happening under the surface of the earth. Imagine these songs being shared in the space under your feet, constantly. Imagine the gardens and the tidal marshlands, the meadows and the forests, all full of choral music inaudible to our clumsy human ears. I begin to wonder if the earth itself is constantly in a state of worship with hymn books open. And if plants and fungi everywhere are constantly passing the peace. Perhaps we need to reframe the letter of James turn it upside down to find the deeper meaning. If the Bible only applies to human interactions, then our ethics only have to include humans. But if it is true that our ethics include the entirety of God's creation, then the places where humans and other beings interface the places and situations where our lives and agendas meet must be the places that form a broader ethic. So let us reread the letter of James with things shifted a bit. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish, selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such so-called wisdom does not come down from below, that does not come down from above, but is disconnected from the earth, and therefore unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will be disorder, and wickedness of every kind. An improvement cut. In the 12 years since we conducted it, signed off on it, watched it unfold on our land, seems to be now to not be the best of choices any more than the so-called science of eugenics is a great way to manage humanity. When we claim to improve any system, 
by removing everything weak and diseased and old. It should be clear that this so-called wisdom does not come from God. The lack of mushrooms was a clear sign to us that in our clumsy attempts to steward our forest, we had committed a sin. We earned two years of firewood and a little cash, and we wounded an entire ecosystem that is taking decades to repair itself. But the wisdom from below is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder. And you covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and the devil will flee from you. Draw near to God, and God will draw near to you. Let us listen and learn from the edges of the earth, where fungi and plants create and renew vitality in ancient and ever-renewing partnerships. Let us try to understand and echo their peaceful and constant exchange. We may join the world in an ending and joyful worship if we can only learn their songs. I invite you to join in our hymn of response, number 382 in the New Century Hymnal, Come We Who Love God's Name. <laughs>
ways that we can be part of the holy exchange, the passing of the peace. The basket in the narthex awaits some of those offerings. The space beyond the doorways of the church awaits many others. I invite you to participate in the singing of those songs as we exchange our resources in God's economy on earth. I also invite you, if you're considering our book study in the coming weeks, there are books available in a bag in the back um, to start that. The book is See No Stranger. You can take a look at it uh, and uh, see what you think. We'll be starting to meet this Thursday at the meeting house. Uh, and I invite people to bring a brown bag lunch and their mats as well to participate in that. And this afternoon, we'll be having the fall gathering, the annual meeting of the Mid-Coast Association of the Maine United Church of Christ. Um, all of our member or member congregations will be meeting by Zoom at 2 o'clock. If you would like to be a part of that gathering, um, the uh, link has been sent out in PCC News this week, so you can click on that email link and jump in at 2 o'clock. And at 4 o'clock, for those of you who are craving some embodied fellowship, the church that had intended to host the in-person gathering will have uh, an invitation for anyone who'd like to gather at 4 o'clock this afternoon at the Edgecombe Community Church. They have a beautiful labyrinth in a garden just outside the church. If you'd like to try the spiritual practice of walking the labyrinth in meditation and prayer, and if you'd like a chance to see some other folks from around the association, you're welcome to convene there around four for that open air gathering. And now, my brothers and sisters, my siblings in Christ, hear these words of benediction. Whether or not we can hear them with our ears, we are surrounded not only by a cloud of witnesses, but a network that is active even beneath our feet, singing songs of glory, sharing hymns of praise. Step out onto the soil, then, recognizing that you are part of a world of unending worship that always points back to the one who made all of us for reweaving the fabric of creation. Go in peace.